more resistance and more hostility from his readers when he wrote this paragraph. Listen to what he says. He says, for say he is, he died at the age of 75 in 1982. He says this, for several decades we psychologists have looked upon the whole matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus and we've acclaimed our liberation from sin as epoch making. Do you hear what he said? When we liberated ourselves from the notion of sin, we considered it epoch making. We've arrived. Exactly the notion that people like Dawkins and all now celebrate. But listen to what this psychologist who was an atheist said. But at length I have discovered that to be free in this sense is to also have the excuse of being sick rather than being sinful. And it is now courting the danger of becoming lost. This danger is, I believe, betokened by the widespread interest in existentialism which we are presently witnessing. In becoming amoral, ethically neutral and free, we have cut the very roots of our being, lost our deeper sense of selfhood and identity, and with neurotics themselves now find ourselves asking, who am I? What is my deepest destiny? What does living really mean? And then he quotes the Anna Russell folk song, psychiatric folk song. At three I had a feeling of ambivalence toward my brothers, and so it follows naturally I poisoned all my lovers. But now I'm happy I have learned the lesson this has taught, that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. No accountability, none. One of the great researches that I did in writing my book, Can Man Live Without God, which was the earliest one I wrote, was to go to Jerusalem and visit Yad Vashem Museum, the Holocaust Museum. And I'd done a lot of research on Adolf Eichmann's life, what took a man from where he was to what he became. You know, Eichmann was tracked down in some little town in Argentina where he's working for a motor car factory. Unknown to him, the Israeli Mossad had tracked him down. If you've read the book, The House on Garibaldi Street, you know the story, and the movie came out too. They watched him from a distance. He would get off from a bus, walk around with his briefcase, look around, make sure nobody was watching, unaware from a distance. They were watching him with high-tech equipment. He would unlock his gate, walk up. Before he unlocked his door, look over his shoulder. A little boy would greet him and slam the door shut. They watched him for day after day after day on this ill-fated day for him. The Mossad near the bus, as he was walking back, felled him, plunged a needle into him and knocked him unconscious in a cloak and dagger operation, flew him out of Argentina, incredible uh, precision with which they'd done, brought him into Jerusalem, brought him for trial. After about 20 years, the man who was involved in it, Peter Malkin, broke his silence. He said, I don't want to say anything, but my days are coming to an end. I just want to tell tell the people one conversation I had with Eichmann. He said, we were on a train while I was bringing him back, and the most startling thing to me was he looked like an ordinary human being. I couldn't believe all that he'd orchestrated for the death of, t- death of tens of thousands. He said, so one day I shut the door in his little compartment, and I sat next to him, and I said, Mr. Reitman, I watched you every day come home, open the door, and greet a little boy. Who was that boy? He said, he was my son. He said, how old is he? He said, he's eight. He said, he's the exact age as my nephew that you killed. You killed my nephew who was eight. He said, Mr. Reitman, can you tell me what's the difference between your eight-year-old boy and my eight-year-old nephew? He said, Reitman just paused and looked at him, stared at him, and said, my son is not Jewish. Malkin said he walked out of there and he sobbed uncontrollably. He had nothing left to say to a man who had no sense of accountability to God of any sort. And Hannah Arendt ends her book on Meichmann by saying it was the ultimate trivialization of evil. The ultimate trivialization of evil. Eternity, redefining existence. Morality, essence, accountability, conscience, and lastly, the dimension of charity, beneficence, the dimension of charity, the supremacy of love. It is this beautiful thing that the Bible tells us about God, that God so loved the world. God 
so loved the world. The entire notion of the Son of Man coming to seek and save that which was lost is a God driven by love, agape, placing value on you and on me. Do you know, if you have no value, neither do your questions. Why do we even value our questions? Because we assume that our life has some essential worth and therefore valuable. And as I look at these four dimensions of eternity, morality, accountability, charity, existence, essence, conscience, beneficence, those are the parameters within which I make my choices. Will it have eternity's blessing and eternal values? Is it more than just a horizontal definition of my moral reasoning? Is it based on the absolute unchanging person of God? Am I accountable for what I am doing here? Can I garb this with the genuineness of love and tell the person, even though I disagree with you, I can honestly say to you, I love you. You know, think of it this way. I'll close with this. That language can be very mystifying, very mystifying. We use words so loosely. Sometimes we use a word in the first sentence and then in the fourth sentence, and nobody says, does he mean something different? The fourth sentence to the first? No, we call that a univocal usage of language. If I say to you, God loves you, and then I say to you, I love you, you pretty much take that epithet love and put it into the context of what it is I'm saying to you. You don't start pouring over your mind and saying, was there any difference in the word there? No, you take it and keep moving on in your thought. But then there are some times where the same word does not do justice because the context brings something deeper. If you ask me, Ravi, are you a good tennis player? And I have the audacity to say to you, yes. And then you happen to be sitting next to a man in, in a plane and you say, what's your name? And you say, well, my name is um, uh, Roger Federer. And he, you say, what's your name? And he says, Roger Federer. So what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a tennis player. And you say to him, are you a good tennis player? And he says, yeah, I'm good. The biggest blunder you'll make is to say, you ought to meet a friend of mine, Ravi Zacharias. You both ought to give me a tennis player. <laughs> I can't even see what he hits, leave alone chase it back. <laughs> same word, different context. That's what you call an equivocation. Univocal, same meaning, equivocal, same word, different meaning. How then do we talk about God? What's the point talking equivocally? If we don't know what it means, what's the point talking univocally when we know it doesn't mean every, the same thing for an infinite being and a finite being? So we borrow a third usage which we call analogical. By analogy, we take that which can be legitimately inferred from one usage onto the other usage. And so when I say to you, I love you, and then I say God loves you too, please understand the difference. When I love you and you refuse to love me, I hurt because I have lost something. When you, I say to you, God loves you and you refuse to love God, God hurts too. God hurts not because he has lost something. God hurts because you have lost something. That's the purity of his love in the value that he places upon you. And if you ask anybody what goodness means, they'll tell you to desire a thing for its own sake. Oscar Wilde, before he died, in his 40s, had plundered many lives. I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Jesus and Oscar Wilde called Sense and Sensuality. Wilde was in his room with his lover, Robbie Ross. Wilde was dying. And he looked at Robbie Ross, he said, Robbie, I have a question for you. Did you love any one of those little boys for their own sake. For a hedonist to start wondering what goodness means? He said, did you ever love one of those boys for their own sake, Robbie? And he says, no. He says, you know what, Robbie? Neither did I. 
bring me a minister. Only Christ is big enough now to heal this heart of mine. Eternity has a way of reaching down to the final moments of life. Morality and accountability will meet you there as well. And ultimately what you will need desperately is the understanding of charity. God's love for you and your return of love for him. And in this world of so many worldviews, I say to people I disagree with, I will disagree with you, but I will never be disagreeable with you. Because if love is lost, then God is lost. And I don't want to lose God in our conversation. That's the way the Christian worldview functions. We stand beside people with whom we do not agree, but we learn to live and let live and celebrate the possibility of truth in the marketplace of ideas, because ultimately God alone is the truth and he is the ultimate judge. This is the paradigm on which you base life's choices. Eternity, morality, accountability, and charity. Those are the foundations that God has given to you and me. And my time is gone. I don't know when it went, but it's gone. Time flies. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. So very kind. Thanks so much. In the early days when I started, whenever people stood up, I knew it was because they were leaving. And it's uh, nice, nice now to have a little bit of difference on that. Thanks so much. Well, we've got about 30 minutes for questions, and we've got a couple of microphones. And what I would uh, plead with you, if you're asking a question, please keep the question brief and keep it to one. Uh, uh, last week, we were at a place I shall leave unnamed, and the opening fellow said, I have three questions for you, and the lineup was so long. And of course, to be charitable, I tried to answer all three, but I wished you'd only asked one. So better to be forewarned than to be quoted in my next meeting. Dr. Zacharias, I have a close family member that has been living with many New Age beliefs for a number of years. Based on monistic pantheism and put into practice through energy healing, they refuse to acknowledge the objective nature of truth and claim they don't mind living with contradictory beliefs as long as those beliefs work for them. What is the best way to share the gospel with a person that claims they are content with contradictions? Very, very good question, very fair question. And um, I've uh, seen that more often than you could ever believe. And of course, I was born and raised in a country where it's very common to have that view. And then if you add to that the other imperatives that follow sometimes, it involves your family also in the same tradition, so on, you're not willing to repudiate the faith of your fathers or whatever. For a person to say, I know it is not coherent, and I'm willing to live with incoherence, is actually saying they don't care about reason and meaning anymore. If reason and meaning are pointless, Reasoning in a meaningful way with that person may also become a pointless exercise. But a person like that sooner or later is awakened into reality by something that will happen. I would say to you the most important thing you can do to them is not preach to them, but live your message and show what a life of coherence actually looks like. Give them an opportunity to hear the words of Christ to listen to messages or read books. I used to leave books for my father all the time, not knowing, not him not knowing that I was leaving them on the table so that he would read it when I was not there. And you do things like that. You give them CDs, you give them tapes, take them to meetings. There was a great movie in which um, Kevin Klein played the lead role, and it's called The Emperor's Club. It's a story of students in a Shakespearean school where one guy gets in by his father's power as a senator. He's not qualified to get in. You have to be highly qualified to get in, but he gets in. And he cheats his way through class every time. And on the last day in the final exam, they've got about four students on the platform where they're going to be put to an oral test of Shakespearean knowledge. 
and he's made it to the final four. And the teacher knows he's cheated all along, but he doesn't know how to pin it on him. And so the teacher's in the middle asking questions, and these four have to go quickly and answer it. And the guy's about to lose, but he has a backup plan. He cheats, he gets the right answer, and wins it. And the teacher, Kevin Klein, just looks at him, and they lock eyes, and he knows he's cheated, but doesn't know what to do. Let's it go. Many years go by, this fellow's now grown up. He's the head of a country club in a big financial empire. So he gets in touch with the teacher. He says, I know that you think I've cheated all my way through, and you couldn't pin it on me. He said, I want to prove it to you that I can still win without cheating. Find the other three and bring them to my country club. I'll host it. So they track the three down. They've not done that well. This boy is a big tycoon. The auditorium is packed. Klein is in the middle as the teacher. And these fellows in their middle years now, the questions are being thrown. This guy's on the verge of losing, and he has a backup plan to cheat once again. And he cheats, and he wins. Klein doesn't know what to do. He goes back to his room, picks up his briefcase, and he stops in the men's room on, before he goes. And he's put his briefcase on one of the counters there, and the man walks in, and he looks at the teacher, and he says, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? What's, what's wrong with what I did? So what? What difference does it make? What's the difference? Tell me what's the difference. The other three have lost out. I'm a big tycoon. I've got my success story. What difference does it make? And the teacher is just looking at him and looking at him, not saying anything. All of a sudden, there's a sound of a toilet flushing. None of them knew there was somebody else in one of the cubicles. And the door opens, and the little boy walks out. He's this man's son. And he comes and stands in front of his father and looks at his dad, and the lips quiver, and the tears run down the face. And he turns and walks away. Klein picks up his briefcase and says, what's the difference? Sooner or later, incoherence will come back to haunt everybody, either in this generation or the next, and they'll find out that incoherence does make a difference. And God will bring that moment in the individual life. You live a life of demonstration. Keep praying for them. Show them you understand from whence they come. And the one thing you can tell them is this. You will have everything you have in the peace of your soul already, plus more. When you find Christ, you will find the source of all peace and the source of all truth. Give him a chance to be the king and leader and the shepherd of your life and soul. But don't force it down. At the right time, they'll know it makes a difference. I have seen so many come to Christ from my own family and my own homeland. In fact, give me 30 seconds more. My brother-in-law, the Christian highest ranking student during his days. I took him to the first Youth for Christ meeting after I came to know the Lord. We were just friends at that time, teens. He came to know the Lord that day, ultimately fell in love with my sister, married her. He was working as the top safety expert for the Atomic Energy of Canada, gave that up, and is now a pastor in a large church in Toronto, brilliant expositor. We are the closest of friends. He was my closest buddy growing up. His parents, Orthodox Hindus, Orthodox to the bone. On his deathbed, his father, who used to ask questions of me in the silence when we talk in a room, he'd make sure his wife didn't come and hear him asking those questions. She was very devoted to the temple. All this went on. On the day that he struck cancer and was lying in a bed in Toronto, it was on Canadian Thanksgiving, he called his family around them and he said, you know, I want to tell you something. All my life, I have just wanted one thing, and that's the truth. And now as I'm dying, I'm discovering it now. I wished I'd discovered it earlier. I want to tell all of you I have found the truth. Do you know what it is, he said? Friends from all of the, te from the temple were standing around the bed, in this Toronto bed. And he looked at them and said, I have found the truth today. It is in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I hope you too will follow him and find that truth in him. His children, grandchildren, and all of the friends utterly stunned with it. Two weeks ago, we were in Toronto. My colleague will tell you, a 65-year-old Hindu woman drove from Ottawa, Orthodox Hindu, came to see me at the back with her son and her husband. 
had the privilege of seeing her come to Jesus Christ in that room, the tears running down her face. And her son wrote to me and said, she wrote to me and she phoned me and said, son, this is the first time in 65 years I have slept well through a night. I'm at peace with God in finding Christ. It'll come. And just pray, live, answer questions. Don't ram it down the throat. And it'll happen. Okay. So. <clears throat> so. Robbie, I asked this question um, on behalf of my 40-year-old son. He says, Dad, I was raised in a Christian family. But what if I were raised in another country, or even in this country, under a, a family of a different religion? Can you tell me that all those millions of people raised in those situations are condemned to hell? He said, Dad, I can't believe that. I need help with that answer, Robbie. Very good question again, and let me answer it in two ways. I very seldom answer a question for anybody like that without asking them a few questions first myself. And if I were sitting across the table from your 40-year-old son, I would say to them, I understand it, you know. I was not raised in a Christian home. In fact, I was living as a total anti-theist all of my teenage years. I had no interest. My ancestors were Orthodox Hindu priests of the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood. So I would say to him, if a person is born in a very poor family, would you ask him to try and go and make a living or would you tell him you were raised poor? I think you should be content to be poor. Just live that way. If a person is born in a home where he's taught to hate, murder, and kill, would you want to change him or would you tell him, go ahead and hate, murder, and kill? That's what your father taught you to do. Why don't you live that way? That philosophy makes no room for truth. It makes no room for the reformer. Reformers come into society because they see wrong. They see abuses. They see misjudgments. Reformers see people being exploited and want to see that change. So that which is normative cannot become that which is an ought, the way to be. That which is ought must become normative. So the two things I would say to him is this. Does truth matter? Is truth exclusive or is truth all-inclusive? If you have found Jesus Christ to be the way, the truth, and the life, trust him. He will help you deal with the world that is raised differently and help you make a difference and a change in their lives. Then I would say this to him. Don't you think that the judge of all the earth will do that which is right? If you, being an evil person like I am, know how to make such a laudatory statement about what is right and what is wrong, you think God is more impoverished than we are and is going to do something less good than we are going to do? Why don't you trust the judge of all the earth to do that which is right? You follow him and he will help you right the lives that are born in different